Um, good evening, everyone, depending on uh, where you're viewing today's live stream. Uh, welcome to our event on COVID-19 and conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, my name is Shabnam Nassimi and I'm the director of the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. I know that there are many viewers uh, joining uh, us today from around the world and some good friends from, from Afghanistan as well. Um, we're delighted to have you all join, uh, join us today for this timely and important discussion on the impact of COVID-19 um, on Afghanistan. Unfortunately, having spoken to the Minister of Public Health, Mr. Firuzuddin Firuz has been tested positive for uh, COVID-19 and won't be joining us this evening. However, we are, we are honored that Afghanistan's Deputy Minister for Public Health, Dr. Wahid Madrul, has taken the time out of his very busy schedule to join us from Kabul and provide us an overview of the situation in Afghanistan. I'd also like to thank um, Ms., uh, Dr. Barnett Rubin, who's a senior fellow at uh, New, York, New York University and associate director um, of uh, Center on International Cooperation, where he directs the Afghanistan and Pakistan regional team. He is also the former senior advisor of the special representative for um, Afghanistan and Pakistan in the US State Department, um, and he has written numerous books on Afghanistan. We are also joined by Michael Kugelman, who is the deputy director of the Asia Program and senior associate for South Asia at the Wilson Center. He's a leading specialist on Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan, and their relations with the United States. He has written extensively for uh, New York Times, Foreign Policy, and many other uh, publications covering topics on the US policy on Afghanistan. We are also honored to be joined by Marvin Weinbaum, who is a professor uh, of political science at the University of Illinois and has served as an analyst for Pakistan and Afghanistan in the US Department of State, um, uh, State's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. He is currently the director of the Afghanistan and Pakistan Studies at the Middle East Institute. We also hope that you will take part in this uh, event today by asking your questions in the comments section um, here on Zoom and on, in a YouTube live stream. So just before we begin, um, as many of you might, may be aware, the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan is a non-for-profit organization um, that is charged with a mission to build stronger relations between, between the UK and Afghanistan by ensuring that Afghanistan's case is fairly represented in parliament and promoting the active participation of British Afghans into British democracy and civil society. With the continuing support of our parliamentary advisors and patrons, we have so far um, been able to host numerous uh, uh, discussions and uh, policy related forums um, focused on Afghanistan, um, uh, sort of particularly around the peace process, women's rights, and so forth. And now with the global crisis of the coronavirus, we are, um, we are honored to be able to host guests um, who have expertise on the subject, to be able to bring to light exactly what the situation is like there. Um, what I'd like to do now is briefly sketch out the situation presently, and then we can quickly move on to the panelists. So in late March, um, Afghanistan's uh, Minister of Public Health uh, publicly shared estimates that up to 25 million Afghans could eventually be affected with the novel uh, coronavirus. This is out of a population of about 36 million people. Um, the, the Afghanistan government has announced a wide range of uh, measures to contain the virus, uh, mirroring global practices of physical distancing, but the weakness of um, the healthcare infrastructure in a country weighed down by poverty and over four decades of conflict has rendered Afghanistan especially um, challenged to manage any major outbreaks. So reports of COVID-19 related deaths may remain low, but hospitals are straining and are beginning to lose um, staff. Um, staff are not only falling ill, with some even dying at the, uh, of the, the uh, disease, but many are simply refusing to work under the conditions that they deem hazardous. Healthcare data is, um, in Afghanistan is historically unreliable, and the government has only managed 
to test around 100 people per day, all of which leaves enormous uncertainty as to the ultimate scope of the problem in a country where roughly only one in four people have access to quality healthcare. Um, in addition to this, the return of nearly 300,000 uh, migrant workers um, since February from Pakistan and Iran um, in one of the virus's um, global epicenters appears to have overwhelmed the government's attempt to contain the outbreak. Um, the, mini uh, the, uh, the Minister of Public Health has also assessed that the virus has spread to almost 29 of the 34 provinces um, as a result of the, the mass returns. So as the toll of, um, as, uh, as yet, the toll on, uh, on Afghans uh, from COVID-19 remains unclear. Um, the World Health Organization does admit that there is no model for how the virus may impact a country such as Afghanistan, which has enormous number of vulnerabilities already. Um, but regardless of how severe the toll is, the public health crisis is not the only, and may not even be the gravest challenge the pandemic uh, will pose. With lockdowns of urban centers, um, leaving thousands of, of uh, day uh, laborers out of work and rising food prices, um, prompting panic and desperation, there is a potential for uh, increased crime. Um, in addition to this, gender-based violence and other chronically underreported criminalities um, has been expected to worsen under um, lockdown conditions. And then we have, of course, the uh, Afghanistan going into 2020 with a divided government facing political, military, and economic crisis. Um, the government has been paralyzed by uh, a month-long dispute prior to, um, to, the, to, to the lockdown um, over who won last year's presidential election, which has prompted the, prompted the US to withhold um, a lot of funding uh, that's vital to the functioning of a country with little tax base um, and, and one that is one which uh, has a healthcare system that is primarily run by NGOs. So um, I think, I guess, the, 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 the focus of today's discussion will primarily be around not only the health impact of the pandemic um, to a country that, frankly speaking, doesn't have much of a healthcare system, but also the repercussions of this on um, an ongoing conflict, on women's rights, etc. And hopefully our speakers can shed more light uh, on their perspective in, in the subject. So I'm going to begin by asking the um, Deputy Minister, Dr. Madraw, um, to lead off the discussion and present um, your opening remarks, if um, that's okay with you. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be part of this Great discussion. And again, a warm greetings to everybody on the panel and those uh, listening to us. I think our, our colleague presented a very good presentation and the, the image is a bit hazy, hazy, so I will try to make it more colorful uh, about the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, there is no doubt that COVID-19 has posed a new challenge to humanity and to our capability as human beings. Today, at least, uh, I always tell the media and friends that we face a challenge that it does not distinguish between powerful and powerless, between empower, just capable health systems and uh, those who are incompetent. It, it damaged everybody, it damaged everywhere. And if we look at the figures, unfortunately, unfortunately, it put most of the powerful uh, economies and health systems on their knees. Uh, I, I, the, the, there is no fact to say what is the cause and what is the reason, but still uh, the, the, those who, who inherit uh, weaker health systems like Afghanistan, still they have a lower number of uh, COVID-19 cases. And that's, that's a favor. Let's have it from God, from our gene, wh whatever. Anyways, uh, but, but that, that, I think that is a chance, but at the same time a threat. And we believe that if the same flood which hit Italy or the United States or China comes to countries like Afghanistan, the human dilemma, the human crisis will be unforgettable in history. Uh, I'm talking uh, on behalf of a health sector which is inherited uh, from uh, conflict 
it is living in a conflict. So we're we are just uh, working in the we're working in a development phase in the face of conflict. Uh, as said in the opening remarks of our colleague, uh, our health sector has great achievements, but at the same time, a lot of failures. And uh, that's why we always say that we don't look at COVID-19 pandemic as a challenge, but as an opportunity as well. Uh, during the last 20 years, a plenty number of uh, global experts has come here, has worked on, on our health system, has provided their theories, and ha has had some opportunities to work in practice as well. But no one, no challenge, has provided us such an opportunity to test our cap capabilities, to test our capacity and to see well, wh which of those interventions that were thought to be successful in the last 20 years uh, are proved uh, unsuccessful. And which are those you know, capabilities, well, uh, the positive points, which could be used today as a le leverage point. In any, with any definition today, uh, well, Afghanistan is among one of those countries with the lowest uh, positive cases. I should correct the information that uh, today we have the capacity to test 2,000 to 2,500 uh, suspect cases with PCR. Uh, labs in, in the country, and through the new uh, fund provided by ADB and the World Bank, soon it will be doubled because we have eight and nine labs today, and it will become fifteen. We are we are we are planning to uh, serve uh, for more resources to upgrade the, uh, the available capacity, but at the same time, at the same time, uh, there is no doubt that there are many positive cases which are left undetected. It is not only the testing capacity, uh, but the uh, hospital uh, or hospital bed capacity as well. During the last 20 years of funds and resources provided by different international partners and the efforts and contributed by the Afghan government, we only have 10,400 beds uh, on country level in our public hospitals. Today, uh, we are planning that, uh, to establish in among, uh, for, uh, just from 10,400, 156 are for ICU beds. Today, we are planning to, stop, uh, to set up another 1,030 ICU beds in six weeks through the you know, new fund we have received from World Bank and EDB. 9,000 beds will be for mild and moderate cases. And we have received another order from his Excellency the President uh, we, are, we are done with the planning and we, we have started deploying bets for another 100,000 bets on the country level for mild and moderate cases. So I believe that uh, besides all the uh, negative points with COVID-19, at least for Afghanistan, it has some positive points as well. First, uh, although there are not, not enough facts until now, it is too early to judge that the pandemic self, uh, COVID-19 nature will only bring a negative impact uh, or just expand the effect of uh, conflict. Uh, what we have experienced until today, it has some positive points as well, especially for Afghanistan. From political perspective, it caused the division that you were talking about, the, uh, just to cause, cause them join each other. At least today we have the news that uh, soon, uh, this is the president, Ashraf Ghani and the ex-CEO will come up to an agreement. And the public believes that one of the pressures put on both sides, uh, especially those who are, who are trying to use the public force, the demonstrations, gatherings, uh, to uh, just fight for what they feel was right, is prevented due to the lockdowns, the curfew, the, the uh, effect of the pandemic. On the other side, when we go to the battlefield, although following the peace dialogue and peace agreement between the United States and the uh, Taliban, none of the conflict inside uh, sites has abided to the agreements they have done, but still the health workforce in our operations uh, are much more better facilitated in those areas which were uh, difficult to operate in the past. Even Taliban now has clearly understood the negative uh, impact of uh, preventing health operations, 
while being being affected, just vulnerable to uh, COVID-19. That, that, that's the positive side. The other factor is that although the attention to Afghanistan, the attention to uh, health sector in Afghanistan from our international partners were lowering, were just declining, we, we got an, another opportunity to receive a big bunch of funds uh, from international partners, at least 100 million from World Bank, 40 from ADB. Uh, I, I just received an email from EU. We will receive another 50 million from uh, EU. And uh, there are negotiations with IMF as well. The, the, the next opportunity which uh, brought us the experience of the last 20 years is that based on the lessons learned from, from last 20 years, we want, we are committed to better, to effectively uh, benefit the, uh, the, the next opportunity which is donated or gifted by COVID-19 to ensure, to better analyze the health system and uh, ensure uh, effective use of these funds in a way that fill the gaps. On the, the, on the negative side, on the negative side, there is a high level of threat for social disorder. Uh, Afghanistan is a country where more than 50% of people living are living under the poverty line. Uh, we we uh, recommended curfew and lockdown in major cities. And I should say that Afghanistan is one of those, or maybe even the only example in the world where we put Herat, one of the major cities, on emergency condition after uh, identifying the first positive case. And Kabul is the one of, or maybe the only capital city, which we put on curfew after identifying the only four positive cases. It helped us to delay the spread of the, uh, the virus. And at some points, for short term, uh, even disconnect the circulation of virus based on the figures we have, but uh, given the uh, power to level in the society and the distrust uh, between the people and government and uh, just uh, a good uh, atmosphere for uh, just these rumor circulation, people are back on the streets. And the, one of the major factors for that is socioeconomic uh, problems. This also could this challenge could also provide an opportunity for some politicians to exploit this atmosphere, but hopefully, hopefully our politicians, the His Excellency the President and the CEO, use it in a positive way, not for exploitation uh, of this chance, but for negotiation. And soon uh, the, the nation will, will witness that, and that, that that's that should be appreciated. So. Uh, just uh, analyzing all these positive and negative uh, impact of COVID-19 and then talking from, on behalf of the uh, health sector, we in the Ministry of Public Health look at the COVID-19 as, as a great opportunity for us. We are committed and we are, we are determined based on the plan we have developed to fill the gaps that we, we could have filled for last, in the last 20 years. We believe that we will not get another similar chance, especially when today the major countries, big economies are uh, busy with, them, with the challenges they themselves have faced. Uh, the post-recovery economy of the global economy will not be in a stage to help uh, those in need like Afghanistan, uh, as, uh, as well as the the negative impact of COVID-19, which will be uh, witnessed um, in recovery phase, which is the NCD, the, uh, high, we will face higher MMR and uh, child mortality rates, could not be uh, could not be tackled with a further fragile system. But uh, if we if we better invest today and have we we have a more uh, strengthened health system, the threats that we face today is the, the vulnerability of some specific layers of our com community, like the internally displaced people, uh, the, re the refugees or the returnees coming from uh, our neighboring countries, uh, as well as the addicts. One of the, one of the main reasons that uh, we expect another uh, human crisis is that uh, our community is restless today uh, the, the, the government and the Minister of Public Health won't be able to further keep them at home 
unless the international community uh, and our um, national government come up with a strategy uh, that could fill in the needs of people who are highly in need, especially as I say, the uh, those who are labor wage uh, dependent, uh, the returnees and the internally displaced people. In such a context, in such a context, we in the Ministry of Public Health are similar to those who are building a stair in the morning and has to raise or step on those stairs in the afternoon. We will have a lot of failures and successes in this process. We will have good learning, learning opportunities, and I'm sure that Afghanistan will uh, present another learning opportunity for the experts. Uh, well, we work in a context, as I say, that we, have, we still have a fragile system. We face the conflict. The poverty is there. And as you said, political division, which we hope that will not continue longer. And the, the ministry is thankful for the politicians for using negotiation instead of exploitation and His Excellency the President for his tremendous, you know, just unbelievable support and the resources they have provided for the uh, Minister of Public Health. In Afghanistan, I believe that this is one of the first or few opportunities which we experience a, a real and practical whole government approach to address a national health challenge. I don't have your voice. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Um, we can move on to um, Dr. Kugelman uh, to, to say his open remarks, uh, if that's all right. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I unmuted myself. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, uh, particularly to participate in a uh, virtual panel as, as distinguished as this one with uh, Barney Rubin and, and uh, Marvin Weinbaum and Dr. Madru as well. Uh, um, I'll, I'll keep my remarks short and I'll um, offer them in three parts. One, I'll talk a bit about vulnerabilities. Uh, I'll talk about, secondly, um, uh, impacts. And three, I'll talk about um, responses in the context of coronavirus in, in Afghanistan. In terms of vulnerabilities, um, you know, we know and we've already heard uh, through both of our uh, speakers so far about just why Afghanistan is, is so vulnerable when it comes to the uh, coronavirus. Uh, and of course, you have a, a heavily capacity constrained and under-resourced health sector, even under ordinary circumstances. But right now, it's far from ordinary circumstances. And of course, there are also constraints with governance, uh, significant levels of poverty, and then, of course, there's geography as well, Afghanistan being a country that is close uh, geographically to China, where the virus originated, and it borders Iran, uh, one of the countries most hard hit by uh, coronavirus so far. And I think what's even worse in this context of vulnerability um, is that there are several factors in Afghanistan that could potentially mitigate COVID impacts in Afghanistan. But unfortunately, they, they will not because they're undermined by other conditions. And you know, what I mean by that, uh, one example, uh, population density levels are not as high in Afghanistan as they are in some neighboring states like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, China. In fact, the data from the World, po World Population Review uh, finds that Afghanistan is the 149th most densely populated country uh, in the world. However, Social distancing is, is difficult to enforce uh, because of governance constraints and because state authority is, is often lacking, especially with many lawless and conflicted spaces. And also because poverty and other factors entail that large numbers of people uh, live and coexist close together. And it should be said that many countries with relatively low population density, including the United States, uh, have been hit incredibly hard uh, by the coronavirus pandemic. And secondly, of course, Afghanistan is a, is a, has a young population. And uh, you know, there are indications that it's people that are older, that are more vulnerable to the, uh, uh, to the virus and are more likely to, to die from it. Um, but in, in Afghanistan, healthcare is a major constraint and you do have large numbers of young people with pre-existing health challenges that make them more susceptible uh, to coronavirus. 
Uh, second point I'll highlight gets into issues of impacts. And um, we heard from, from Dr. Madru uh, already some of the, the, the things I was gonna highlight, but obviously the economic impacts could be very significant. It's too early to tell exactly what's going to happen. But uh, the impacts of lockdowns on businesses and economic activity will be considerable. Um, I think that unfortunately the, the pandemic could accentuate the uh, distorted nature of the economy in Afghanistan in which you essentially have a private, a licit private sector, a legal private sector that is fairly weak, but uh, you have an illicit economy and an informal economy that is quite strong and will likely remain so uh, to a great extent during the pandemic. Uh, poppy production, uh, probably will not be tremendously affected by coronavirus. You, you're still having now uh, large numbers of people working uh, at work in what is a very labor intensive uh, business. It's also a profitable business. And of course, there are many uh, poor, poor farmers that are willing to risk their health and defy uh, any lockdown orders in order to get paid, understandably so. Um, and there are reports of uh, uh, official border crossings with Pakistan um, having a lot of restrictions put in place. But there are a number of more unofficial border checkpoints that remain open, allowing for, um, for smuggling and a lot of commercial traffic and a lot of human traffic. And so uh, open, unof uh, open unofficial borders may keep the informal economy going, but it also risks more community spread of uh, coronavirus in Afghanistan. Another impact, which again was hit on earlier, uh, food security. Um, Afghanistan is, is quite dependent on food imports from countries that have imposed some considerable uh, restrictions on their borders, like Pakistan, like Kazakhstan. Uh, India is a top partner of Afghanistan, but it cannot easily get food to Afghanistan because its rival, Pakistan, does not provide New Delhi with transit rights through Pakistan to access Afghanistan for trade purposes. Um, and meanwhile, transporting shipments of food more broadly is difficult under ordinary circumstances because of infrastructural constraints, violence, among other things. And so this is all doing a number on food supplies now. Um, so food supplies have plummeted, food costs have skyrocketed. And this was, this was happening way back. I mean, this is not something that's just started happening in the last few weeks. Even back in March, uh, there were reports of wheat prices rising by as much as 20%. And the sad irony is that there had been hopes, there had been high hopes uh, earlier this year in Afghanistan among many farmers that this would be a better year. It would be a fairly good year for food security in Afghanistan. There had been a lot of snow, followed by plenty of rain uh, that suggested uh, that agricultural production could flourish um, this year. Of course, it, has, it may not end, end up that way. Final uh, impacts issue to highlight is, is violence, potential impacts um, of the coronavirus on violence. And here, unfortunately, I don't envision that much of an impact. Um, Taliban offensives have intensified in recent, ones, in recent weeks, as have, I should say, Afghan state offensives and US airstrikes and so on. Um, the Taliban has never stopped fighting Afghan forces ever since the US-led war began almost 19 years, 19 years ago. The Taliban has never declared a ceasefire. Um, there was a reduction of violence for a brief period of, of days earlier this year, of course. And there was a brief truce that the Taliban agreed to during the Eid holiday a few years back, but that was just for a few days. Um, I imagine that it would take a lot to get the Taliban to lay down its arms uh, on account of a pandemic because violence is, is its most powerful form of leverage. And if it lets up or stops fighting, uh, it loses leverage and it potentially loses bargaining power in future talks as well. And so perhaps the best bet is to hope for the Taliban to, is not for the Taliban to stop fighting, but to hope that it can, will cooperate uh, in other ways, by providing access to health workers in areas they control, and that they will not target health workers anywhere. Now, if I understood the the comments that Mr. that Dr. Madru was making, he was suggesting that, in to some levels, that has already there are indications that, that that that's already happening, and there is a precedent for the Taliban um, agreeing to cooperate uh, on access for humanitarian workers. Last year. Uh, as I recall, it, it, it announced a removal of a ban that it imposed on the Red Cross operating uh, in, Afga in Afghanistan, and it provided security guarantees as well. 
Uh, third and, and final point is on the issue of responses to the, uh, the pandemic in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I think clearly there is a need for international assistance in terms of ramping up economic support and exports, um, along with pressing the Taliban to agree to some concessions that allow Afghanistan to be in a better position to fight the pandemic. But you know, this is a tough time for the international community and especially the wealthier countries that comprise the main uh, focus of the international donor community. You know, so many of them, including of course the United States have been very hard hit by the pandemic and I think it could be hard for the international community, at least in the immediate term, to muster the bandwidth and the resources to uh, scale up support to Afghanistan when, you're over, when, when it is so overwhelmed with a complex and deadly emergency at home. So I think it could be some time before Afghanistan really gets the help that it needs from the international community. Um, and I will conclude there. Thank you. I think you're still on mute. Um, I, okay, there we go. Thank you. I don't know why that keeps happening. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kimun, for that sort of very extensive analysis of what the impact of the of the virus will have um, in the on the infrastructure and political climate of Afghanistan. I will swiftly now move on to Dr. Rubin for your opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, and well, good to be on here with all of you, and particularly with uh, Dr. Madru. Um, let me, I think first, let me just say a little more about the issue of food prices, because food prices are a very sensitive issue in Afghanistan. Um, and they have not been directly affected by the pandemic, but they've been affected by the closure of borders and they could eventually be affected by uh, difficulties in the supply chain. Um, However, in the data I've seen shows that when the Pakistan closed the border in March, uh, that was the main supply route for for, uh, for wheat, and that led to rise in food prices, which has has remained about 15 to 20 percent for different commodities. But it has been steady now, pretty much through April, and that's partly because the government has in fact mobilized. I know President Ghani is very conscious of this issue because uh, I'm old enough that he and I were working together in 1991 and 1992 when there was a similar issue in Kabul uh, at the time of Dr. Najibullah. And he told me at that time, Dr. Najibullah would check the food supplies first thing in the morning. Uh, and part of what the government has done is it's made new agreements with Kazakhstan, with India, has got Pakistan to open the border. Unfortunately, there are still serious problems with Iran. Um, but we don't know if the, the pandemic as it spreads may lead to border closures uh, in the future. But clearly the government is watching for that. Let me say a little about the, the peace process. I'll start since Michael talked about the ceasefire. The Taliban in the past have agreed to short-term truces for healthcare purposes, like there was one about 10, 15 years ago for to allow polio vaccination. Um, but, and they have, uh, as, as just like the government, although not obviously to the same extent or as effectively, the Taliban have also been trying to demonstrate their capability to deliver public services. They put out propaganda vi uh, videos uh, about, um, about COVID-19 and you know, public recommendations about social distancing and so on. Um, but they have, uh, they have not responded to calls from the Afghan government, the UN Secretary General, the United States, and many others for a humanitarian ceasefire to allow treatment. Uh, and that I'm sure, and I'd be interested in hearing more from Dr. Madru, I'm sure that the con continuing existence of conflict and closed roads and so on in some areas is inhibiting the access of the government uh, uh, to certain areas and its ability to treat it. Uh, we did have some hopes uh, we, some of us, that it would create pressure, just as Dr. Madru said, perhaps it created some pressure for the two uh, uh, contending presidential aspirants to reach agreement, which I understand they have today, with it. It would also create pressure for a ceasefire. So far, we have not seen that uh, be very effective. But let me just uh, mention a couple of other areas where it can affect the, the peace process. First, the issue of prisoners. Throughout uh, the world, uh, we have seen that the disease spreads most quickly where large numbers of people are, are kept in close confinement. 
and prisons are one of those uh, locations. So there is great, there is considerable danger that the disease will spread quickly within the prison system in Afghanistan. And one of the Taliban's demands for the opening of negotiations with the Afghan government and other Afghans is the release of up to 5,000 prisoners who are held. And the government has, uh, it has started releasing prisoners, but it is doing it in a measured and deliberate fashion, uh, which is understandable. But, and it has also at the same time announced the release of several thousand prisoners of other categories simply because of the pandemic. I don't know how many have actually been released. Um, but there is the danger, and the Taliban have been talking about this, if the disease does start to become uh, a pandemic in the prisons, that the Taliban prisoners will start succumbing to that, and some of, some of them could die. Now, the International Committee of the Red Cross is already active in the prisons together with the Ministry of Public Health. So perhaps there's some preventive measures in case. That is one point. Second, the same problem that exists with prisons also exists with armed forces, uh, because armies are living in barracks. We already saw how an American battleship was put out of commission, basically, by the virus. It, it was it had about over a tenth of the people on board that battleship succumbed to it. Its commander was fired. He may be reinstated. And the same could happen to any military unit which gets infected by uh, the battle on any side. But, but, it's, but of course, uh, conventional forces are much more vulnerable to that than guerrilla forces like the Taliban. So we'll have to see what, and in fact, it has, I don't know what effects it may have on the Afghan national security forces, but the US forces uh, have actually suspended a lot of their movements internationally and within Afghanistan. And it is the, the effects of the uh, pandemic appear to be accelerating the pace of the, the US withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. That is what President Trump appears to want. And let me uh, conclude by saying I, uh, and I'm not, uh, that the, probably the biggest effect on Afghanistan of the pandemic will not be the direct effects in Afghanistan, but the effects that it has on the United States. Because 75% of our public expenditure in Afghanistan, including most of the Ministry of Public Health, depends on aid from countries uh, of which the US is the main aid provider. Um, the U.S. has already suspended a billion dollars of aid, that's almost 20 percent, because of the political dispute, which hopefully that will be restored after today. But uh, nonetheless, um, it, it seems President Trump is reported to have said that he doesn't want his soldiers stuck in Afghanistan with the pandemic. Uh, and most important, the United States is now spending, has now allocated two and a half trillion dollars and will probably allocate more for relief. We had a, an announcement of unemployment today, which is the highest level of unemployment we've had since the Great Depression. Uh, we had, don't know yet how much the economy of the United States will uh, continue to decline, all of which will create a political atmosphere, which I'm sure will put a lot of pressure against any kind of foreign assistance because of all the money. That, and, and that will probably accelerate the political pressures, not just for military withdrawal, but also for uh, disengagement with Afghanistan and many other countries and the decrease of foreign assistance, which uh, could prove challenging to the Afghan government in many ways. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rubin, uh, for highlighting particularly the impact um, that the virus will have on uh, the Taliban um, uh, prisoner release uh, agenda and also moving forward in terms of the peace force, which we'll be, we will be discussing shortly. Um, I'll just um, ask Dr. Um, Marvin to um, be the last sort of speaker to provide his opening remarks and then we can move on to the questions and answers. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so much has already been covered that as the last of the speakers, uh, I'll see if I can find something that uh, is a little bit different. But uh, let me say that, you know, I find it sad and ironic in a way that with the peace talks stalled, the agreement among the political elites dragging on uh, a war which is essentially stalemated. It's the only, it's only that the coronavirus is making any progress. Uh, the health crisis thus far, seems to me, um, is unfor unfortunately has not had the effect of pushing in a positive direction areas of national concern 
that are at impasse, as I've just mentioned. One might have really hoped that with this challenge here, that we would see somewhat of a stand down uh, as these competing elements find a common enemy. And if anything, of course, the, these conflicts make it more difficult to address the, the very real health crisis. Uh, and since we expect that this pandemic in Afghanistan is going to go on for some time, we also have to take into consideration that if the peace process should show signs of breaking down, uh, if political divisions in the country should sharpen, should the balance of power between um, the Taliban and the Afghan forces change, as very well may happen uh, as the U.S. forces uh, depart, uh, particularly if they take with them air power. Uh, then we may very well see a further darkening of this situation. Uh, it's been noted here that the Taliban have welcomed foreign medical workers, have encouraged uh, uh, in areas that they control uh, a humanity, have encouraged rather a uh, good health practices. Um, but on examination, as some have, they have found that much of what the Taliban have said about the health crisis here has been used mainly for propaganda purposes and that the reality is somewhat different. Uh, and the Taliban have, as has been repeatedly said, rejected a humanitarian ceasefire, which is the most important action that they could take. Uh, and that in this situation where the nation has diverted its attention to the health crisis and has to deal with urban unrest and criminality, which are growing with some rapidity, uh, we find that the Taliban are also finding new opportunities to advance their military objectives. Uh, the, the virus uh, has, uh, has been slow in a way to enter the consciousness uh, of Afghans, uh, uh, but I think what we have to recognize here is that the, it's not the numbers at this point or even in the future, but of course it has to be measured against, as people have pointed out, what is a fragile healthcare system, a high level of malnutrition, uh, and low government effectiveness. Sorry if I have to say this in a general way, uh, Dr. Madhru. Uh, even as the number, as we've seen here at the moment, uh, is fewer than 4,000 4, reported cases, as has been pointed out here, the long-term prospects here of more than half of the population contracting the disease uh, is a very real, a great reality, as I say, against what are the capabilities of the system. Uh, now, Afghanistan, like all developing countries, has that issue of balancing off uh, their uh, measures taken for health welfare against the measures that they have to address or that they have to take uh, for economic welfare. All countries face this, but it's a far more acute situation in countries like Afghanistan, poor countries like Afghanistan, where not to take seriously either of those uh, could be disastrous. Uh, most Afghans have no access to quality health care providers, and more than half of the population uh, lives below the poverty level. Uh, we've heard a lot here about the difficulties of containment. Uh, and how continue there continues to be, and no way of really uh, uh, ignoring the need for Afghans elsewhere to return, particularly from as have from Iran and, and Pakistan. Uh, but they, of course, have seeded the rest of the country here with uh, with new uh, areas of contagion. Um, Essentially, though, the difficulty in containment is, as, as I think it's been alluded here, is that people have to 
get out and find ways to earn a living uh, because the, the choice here is not doing so and perhaps creating situations where they and their, their families will be in a position here of, of near starvation. Foodstuffs has, has been pointed out, uh, been in short supply uh, uh, because imports have become so, indif so difficult, which is related to the health crisis. Uh, the, the country also is facing, of course, a, an economic crisis. 96% um, uh, of the revenues that are obtained through, uh, through customs are, are not being collected. And tax, it's reported that the tax revenue in general has declined 30%. Um, and this is hardly a time. The international community, of course, it plays a very large role in compensating for that. This is hardly, a, I think, a good time for the United States to be cutting as it uh, has threatened to do so, $1 billion in support uh, and has threatened still more. Uh, it would seem to me this is an excellent time for the U.S. to be exercising soft power, uh, where instead of early troop withdrawals, it would dedicate that its troops to helping to keep the food and medical supply lines flowing. Uh, lining up here, winding up here, uh, I, as has been pointed out, there's the silver lining here is that the reach of the virus may, and the overall severity of the infections may be limited by the fact that 64% uh, of the population is under 25 years of age. Uh, and that, uh, of course, a still sizable part of the population, large size, large, large size of the population is uh, scattered in rural communities uh, outside the reach of the coronavirus. Now, if the situation, though, in general, is the forecast here is depressing, and I, I'm afraid that my remarks have been on, on the negative side, um, it's because the virus in Afghanistan finds a host nation that rather than building its defenses against the virus's attack has been unable to turn its energies toward, uh, toward that building of uh, its defenses, but instead it finds that its energies are being absorbed so much by incessant ideological combat, partisan and personal squabbling, and the competition for power. Thanks. Thank you so much to our distinguished panelists for um, their sort of initial uh, overview on the subject. Um, if I could ask the audience to start sending us their questions, you can use the comment section here or on YouTube uh, and please make them brief and relevant. Um, so, but I'm going to start with a few, with at least one um, question myself uh, to get the discussion going. Um, and I'm happy for uh, anyone to take this. Um, it's very clear that Afghanistan is facing a multitude of challenges, um, but it seems that one of the overarching issues is the peace process uh, agreement and the US withdrawal and the timeline uh, that they've set. Um, and what that means at a time when Afghanistan is facing a pandemic that you know, it, it's difficult to, to, um, to ascertain whether that they, they will be able to survive from it. Um, I guess I'd like to ask what COVID-19 could mean for US policy in Afghanistan, including um, US troop presence there, and um, whether it could possibly um, change the, uh, their agenda um, moving forward. If I may. Um, as I, according to media reports, President, it has, uh, President Trump wants to accelerate the troop withdrawal. That's not a decision. That's reports about what his feelings are. Uh, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and certainly, as I mentioned, the uh, economic, internal economic pressures that the U.S. will face 
and the internal readiness pressures that the US military will face as a result of the pandemic all militate against uh, ex extending or in, uh, the engagement with Afghanistan. And, uh, however, uh, in addition, of course, the fact that travel has been suspended, so the social distancing is in effect, means that much diplomacy has also been extended. But despite that fact, uh, Ambassador Khalilzad, the US Special Representative for Afghan Reconciliation, uh, is in the region now. He met with the Taliban in Doha, he is in Delhi, he's going to Pakistan, and then he will go to Kabul to meet with the Afghan leadership, presumably a newly unified Afghan leadership, um, uh, to try to accelerate the process. Part of his message is um, that the um, pandemic makes it even more urgent to get the in intra-Afghan talks, the negotiations among the Afghan sides underway. Um, however, again, an obstacle to that is the idea was that the negotiators and uh, from, from the Taliban and from the Islamic Republic side would meet perhaps in Norway or some other country for a long period of time, uh, and there would be representatives of the region, other Afghans from civil society and opposition parties could come and lobby for what they wanted in the peace agreement and so on. All of that cannot take place as it was originally envisaged, uh, and neither can the diplomacy that, was, uh, that it would be needed to bring it about. So uh, we'll have to see, uh, you know, a peace agreement cannot really be negotiated over Zoom like this because most of the work is done uh, outside of the uh, formal me of the actual meetings and, and through human contact. So um, that in itself is, is an obstacle, but we haven't gotten to the point in the agreement in the process yet where that obstacle is concrete because there's no agreement yet on holding the meetings. Excellent. Could I just? Could yeah, I just um, you know, one would. Oh, excuse me. One one would think that. Mike, Michael, did you want to go ahead, please? No, no, go ahead. I'll go after you. You know, one would think here now that uh, uh, there would be some re good reason to, as I suggested, keeping American forces there. But I think what we're recognizing here is that almost any level of violence uh, is going to be insufficient to deter the United States here from what is the course that it's taken, and that is that the troops should be largely gone uh, by the election. Uh, that, uh, that seems to be inevitable here. Uh, I, can't, I can't imagine anything except the most spectacular of, uh, of uh, acts of violence that might question that determination. So I think we have to see it in a context, particularly since uh, President Trump already had, in last September, had stopped, aborted a a, what could have been uh, a, a beginning of a withdrawal. Uh, and in a way, I think that the Taliban are testing also. They know that there are enormous lengths to which they can go here without, uh, without, without making it politically impossible for President Trump uh, to alter his plans. Uh, at the same time, I think they're smart enough to know you don't want to go too far. And so where what we are seeing is that although the level of violence, as we all know, uh, remains very high, uh, uh, they have not been, from the Taliban at least, the, the kinds of suicide attacks, particularly high profile ones in the cities, that might very well create this political difficulty for President Trump to alter his plans. So just to uh, to add what Barney and add to what Barney and Marvin had to say, um, you know, I it's true as was mentioned. There have been media reports that uh, Trump uh, wants to uh, to accelerate the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan because of the coronavirus. Certainly, I think it's possible that he could use uh, COVID nineteen as a pretext for an acceler accelerated withdrawal. Now, President Trump has never been comfortable staying in Afghanistan, and he said that when he announced his first Afghanistan strategy back in August of 2017, that he went against his own instincts in deciding to stay uh, in Afghanistan. And I do believe that he has become increasingly frustrated over the last few months, particularly as there hasn't been as much forward movement as he would have liked to see toward launching the intra-Afghan dialogue after the US-Taliban deal was concluded more than two months ago. Um, 
And, uh, you know, the, the president always talks about America first and that his, his prime objective overseas is to secure and protect American interests and lives. And, you know, so he would have a reason to worry about U.S. troops uh, getting infected in, in Afghanistan. I believe that there have been several members of the NATO mission in Afghanistan that have tested positive. I don't think the nationalities have been revealed. I'm not sure they're Americans, but there have been a few cases. But, and, and I should say, if that were to happen, if Trump were to announce that he was going to uh, quicken the withdrawal of U.S. forces in a way that they would be all out well before uh, the spring of next year, uh, that would clearly be a, something that would embolden the Taliban and I think would make the Taliban have less of an incentive to actually sit down and negotiate some type of power sharing deal when instead it would feel it would have a great battlefield advantage. It can just pick up the fight on the, uh, on the battlefield and take complete power uh, by force. But all this said, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end here, you know, Trump is, to put it mildly, he is mercurial and extremely unpredictable. There are many things that he said that he would want to do in Afghanistan and elsewhere that he's eventually been walked back from doing by, by advisors. Um, and you know, it, it is true that some of the most, some of the, the prominent folks in the White House that were really pushing for not leaving Afghanistan precipitously, you know, they're no, no longer in the administration, like a, an H.R. McMaster or something like that. Um, but still, I, I think that we should certainly be cognizant of those reports coming out, suggesting that he may want to get out uh, faster than he had wanted to earlier because of coronavirus. But keeping in mind the broader context, that he's very, he changes his mind all the time it's really hard to predict what he really thinks. And I think just the other day, there was someone who's been nominated for a senior position at the Pentagon. I can't remember his name. He was having a nomination hearings and he had indicated that um, he would support the idea of deploying more troops uh, to uh, Afghanistan if these Taliban offenses continue to increase and there's no peace. Uh, there's no peace deal that starts. So it's, it's all very hard to make sense of. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Um, I think I'll move on to some questions from the audience now. We have quite a bit of them on here and on, on YouTube. And I think the first one that seems to be quite um, common uh, amongst our audience is, um, is on Afghanistan's track record with managing international aid. There is a lot of concerns around the transparency of um, any aid that will be um, offered or sent to Afghanistan to tackle um, COVID-19. Um, so I guess looking at what other mechanisms can be put in place or how the role of NGOs could be, um, could be I guess, bigger uh, in, this, in this fight, um, to be able to work closely with the Afghan government to ensure that the, the aid and the funds are being used for um, the purposes that it's been sent for. So yes, anyone can pick that up. Um, yes. So as part of the government, I'll be more than pleased to comment on that. You know, first, corruption is undeniable. Unfortunately, that is a challenge, that is a problem that has weakened the system for the last uh, 20 years. And in such a condition where a crisis is there and a common, a common scenario in procurement of single sourcing, you know, that could be a threat and that could be concern. Uh, both on national and local level and provincial level and provincial level which most part of the fund goes there because uh, until now from the government uh, fund uh, about 20 to 30 percent comes to the national level uh, and the, the rest goes to provincial local level which is about 2.4 uh, billion uh, Fs. Uh, at the provincial level there is a, an inclusive committee which, has, which is led by the provincial governor and includes members from uh, different parts of the society, including the civil society, the private sector, the uh, local government, as well as the health sector. Uh, and the, the procurement processes are observed and overseen by, the, by this committee. Uh, and wh whatever they do will, will be approved by this committee, which has members from this different uh, parts of uh, the community. Most of the, you know, the procurements are done internationally because the, the products we need on local level are not available in the local market. 
The procurement, are, uh, the, the first batch, which is $10.5 million, was done to process through NPA, and now the 100% procurement and recruitment uh, authority is with the Ministry of Public Health. The next phase, which is the big bunch of money, which is about 100 million from World Bank and 40 from EDB, is not processed directly by the Afghan government or by the Ministry of Public Health. The procurement will be conducted through WHO and UNICEF, uh, locally and internationally. We will get the services based on the program and plan we have provided to them, but we will not do the procurement. So I don't, I don't believe that although, although corruption is an issue here, but I don't believe there should be a major concern because the resources which are provided to us until now, on the contrary, that what, what people hear uh, in media is about $15 million uh, directly to the Ministry of Public Health, uh, from which $10.5 million were uh, transferred to a procurement deal in Germany. Uh, the rest of the needs will be procured through UNICEF and WHO, uh, which should be which should be acceptable at least for our international partners. And you were also pointing at the role of NGO as an Afghan youth was worked with the U.S. Embassy, the US, UACID, Afghan government, and international other international agencies. I should say that the blame of corruption uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, should not be directed only to the Afghan government or Afghan institutions, especially for the first uh, one and a half decade where more than 75% of the pledges were coming through the NGOs and contracting uh, companies. Uh, so we don't have a good track record with the NGOs compared with the Afghan government. If the, if the blame comes, it is unfortunately shared, uh, especially uh, with the health sector, where uh, about 90 to 90 percent of our essential health services are provided through contract out, another challenge or dilemma that we faced and experienced in this emergency phase is the contract out services actually gets out control from the system. And one of the main, main reasons that still we receive criticism from communities is that the, the services that are provided in the public hospitals are not replicated in, in those centers which are uh, governed by and led by the NGOs. And any change we want when we want to bring in the scope of their work, it takes a lot of bureaucracy, it is out of our control, and it is a good experience and a lot of learning should be, should be learned from this context where in emergency context, contract outs and NGOs where the government doesn't have direct control on the resources, there is no flex enough flexibility to manage resources efficiently, would be a huge challenge. And we can provide more facts on that. Thank you. Um, just, oh, go on, yes. I think you're, uh, you're on mute. I had muted myself when I thought I was unmuting myself. Um, I, I want to second what Dr. Majru said about uh, responsibility for corruption, because um, there's a misconception uh, in the West and UK, US, that it, corruption in Afghanistan means government officials stealing foreign aid. That is not the primary form of corruption. Most of the money that goes to Afghanistan is not what we think of as foreign aid. It's military expenditure. And a lot of the uh, expenditure on military operations and security is a major part of corruption. And the other part of aid, as Dr. Medrou rightly said, most of it has not gone to the government. But uh, the, gov the government has requested on budget direct funding for uh, the programs of the line ministries, as they are called. And that's been a, a we, people have been working on it for many years. And one of the first ministries to qualify for direct on budget assistance was the Ministry of Public Health. I think it was the second one after the Ministry of Rural Reconstruction and Development. So the Ministry of Public Health has a long track record of responsible management of public funds. So I don't think that uh, people in aid donor countries should be that concerned about aid to the Ministry of Public Health being misused. Great, thank you um, for that. Um, uh, whilst we were on the topic of um, the management um, of AIDS by the Ministry uh, of Public Health, one of the other questions that we have 
um, from one of our audiences is testing facilities. Um, the fact that it's been quite limited up until now, and there are concerns that it may be poorly managed or people who, um, I guess, come from a certain, I guess, background or family are able to get the tests um, a lot more easier and quickly. Um, and it hasn't become the same, um, I guess, um, in terms of how widespread the, um, the testing has been across Afghanistan. So maybe we can, if you can highlight exactly or clarify um, how testing um, is administered in Afghanistan. Uh, thank you, thank you. In a, in a society where we have experienced three or four decades of conflict, which has uh, caused a huge level of anxiety, stress, uh, depression, and rumor circulation uh, due to distress between the institutions, well, you expect uh, similar concerns and uh, thoughts. But what I should say regarding the two parts, regarding the testing capacity, just three months ago, we had zero capacity to test coronavirus in Afghanistan. Zero. We were sending samples to Netherlands. Today, at least we have 2,000 to 2,500 tests per day. Uh, so this shows this shows uh, a huge change. I am appointed since last two weeks, and during the last two weeks, we have not heard any news. Uh, denoting on stock out of uh, RNA kits or amplification kits or RNA items. Uh, we are planning to double the capacity and then if needed to quadruple the capacity of testing. That's one part. Secondly, when it comes to um, uh, prioritizing people for testing, I hope we were, we were able to do that, uh, not, to, not to have these big voices in media. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot prioritize people by intention and by chance uh, because when the samples go to the lab, they're coded, and when, when it goes to biosafety cabins, they don't have their mobiles, they don't have their emails, they, they don't receive anything except the VTMs to tell them that X or Y uh, sample is there and please make sure that he comes first. One of the reasons that you, you hear these big voices in media and so in mass media and social media is that the voice of those normal public is not heard. The voice comes from those media workers or those politicians or those rich people that they, they, they expect their results to come in hours and it takes them days. And that's, that's when you, you hear all these uh, propaganda. What I can assure uh, the audience is that there is no prioritizing scheme or intention in testing. There, that's the clear cut answer. The problem uh, which I am, when I analyzed the reason for the delay was the, uh, in the tracking system, which hopefully today, even the full day, my team was working there, which will be resolved in one to two days. The other part was the expectation. People, people thought that they could receive the result of uh, PCR test in 12 hours, which in our system, given the transportation challenges, a lack of uh, flights, lack of uh, normal uh, road transportation, it takes us longer, 24 hours to 48 hours. 98% of the samples during the last two weeks have, pro have been processed in this, within, within this schedule. 2% are either lost or delayed, and that has caused this propaganda, and we are, we are focused on that 2% to make sure that we don't give excuses to those who are spreading rumors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madro, for clarifying that, um, which has become quite widespread in, in the media. Yes, Dr. Rubin, you wanted to mention. Very, very briefly. This problem of discrimination and testing is not unique to Afghanistan. We have it in the United States. In fact, there's a joke in the, here in the United States that if you think you might be infected and want to get tested, you should cough in the face of a rich person and find out what the, what his test says. <laughs> right. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Um, so I've been trying to sort of see what um, comment, because there are quite a lot of questions and, and time is limited. So I'm um, grouping a few questions together. Another one that um, that's quite common is, is again on on the peace talks, um, and that's uh, particularly around. Um, so let me 
just find that again. Yes. Yeah, so um, following the the increased number of migrants returning to Afghanistan, what um, mechanisms should be put in place in terms of the, the Afghanistan's vulnerability with um, it opening its borders um, in, for instance, Pakistan, where thousands returned um, and with, with very limited um, immigration checks or a coronavirus testing, um, you know, that, that the implications of that could have been quite grave um, to the spread of the virus in Afghanistan. And, and presently, that's still the case. So what mechanisms um, can be put in place moving forward for that? Should I go again? Or... Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. okay. Uh, but, uh, I, I don't know how to put it, uh, but, but we could expect nothing better than what we, we faced from our neighbors during the start of the pa pandemics. Uh, the flood of uh, the influx of returnees from Iran and then the, the way Pakistan uh, opened the border. Uh, so unfortunately we, we cannot expect my, uh, even better than that. The same, the same will, will continue, although we tried our best through the diplomatic channels to convince our neighbors, especially Iran, to not to deport uh, big flux of uh, people to Afghanistan. What we can do in our borders, border bordering provinces, is to increase our capacity to find, test, isolate, and treat uh, the sus uh, suspected and positive cases. And in, if, uh, within that strategy, the number of uh, beds today we have is uh, 3,200, and only from that 700 beds is only, only in Herat province. In the next phase, we PCR tools uh, and then enhance the capacity in Kandahar uh, to make sure that we have the capacity to identify, test, treat, and isolate the positive cases. The new order we have received from the president, which is 100,000 beds for moderate and uh, mild and moderate cases, is majorly focused on those provinces which are more vulnerable and includes the borders, the bordering provinces with Iran and Pakistan. We have been trying and we will not stop that through our diplomatic channels to work with neighbors and make sure that uh, they, they do what they can do in a, uh, and just uh, lower the number of people returning from uh, those countries or at least help us in a way to make sure that we can, we can test. Yes, Dr. Rubin. Hey. Um, uh, yes, also it's important to bear in mind that borders have multiple functions. Um, the head of the UN's World Food Program uh, made a very prominent speech recently in which he warned that one of the worldwide effects of the pandemic could be very severe famines because of the impact of uh, the pandemic on food production, distribution, marketing, and on the, uh, on, on the earning power of uh, food consumers. I might note that according to WFP's office in Kabul, the purchasing power of day laborers and of nomads has decreased by about 20% in the past uh, couple of months. And those, the borders, if you close them for the flow of refugees because of contamination, you also are closing the, the food imports. That is what happened when the border with Pakistan was closed. You can say, uh, well, they should let through food imports, but not refugees. But the fact is, Afghanistan and Pakistan do not have the capacity to manage their borders in that detailed uh, a manner. Um, Iran uh, is, of course, under American sanctions, which inhibits uh, cooperation with them. And, uh, and I might add that even as the Taliban have refused a uh, ceasefire for humanitarian purposes, the U.S. has refused to uh, lighten sanctions against Iran for humanitarian purposes. Uh, so uh, it, it, that also is contributing to uh, the problem of managing Afghanistan's borders. So probably what Dr. Madhru says that they are not really capable of doing much better than they are now is probably the case. But uh, bear in mind the effect on food prices and distribution is fundamental, even if it is indirect and may not appear for a few months. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Rubin. Um, the other question uh, that's come up um, is around the post-election political crisis, um, and particularly whether there is a chance 
for uh, the two sides um, to find some sort of uh, agreement um, or whether they'll be approaching the negotiations uh, in a divided uh, manner. Um, so is there anything that you, you can contribute uh, to that question and whether you have any, any um, information to, to shed a light on? Yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes, Dr. Mandro. Yeah, Dr. Ruben, you go first and I'll be. Already, and that said, what I also heard independently, which is that apparently President Ghani and Dr. Abdullah have reached uh, agreement today, and that will be announced later. And even before they reached political agreement, Dr. Abdullah has said that the uh, list of negotiators uh, that President Ghani's government pre presented can represent all the elements of the Islamic Republic. So I think that, well, they might want to uh, change it. And uh, under the agreement, uh, Dr. Abdullah will have a very substantial role in leading the peace process. Uh, so I think that guarantees that there will be a consolidated position. Uh, uh, position. Of course, uh, there will be lots of problems along the way, and people who are unhappy about peace negotiations always seize on those problems and claim that the peace negotiations are about to collapse. But peace negotiations collapse every day until they succeed. Excellent. Um, okay, well, um, we definitely have quite uh, a lot of, we've, we've covered already quite a lot of areas. Um, um, I guess what we can, what I'd like to do now is just um, take a few of the questions and um, ask it in a conclusive manner and uh, hopefully each of the speakers can um, can give us their last uh, conclusive remarks on the situation. Um, as you're all very confident in, 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 in your understanding that strengthening um, Afghanistan's healthcare infrastructure uh, fast enough and dramatically enough to cope effectively uh, with the, um, the public health consequences of the virus is probably unrealistic at this particular time, even with lockdowns and social distancing measures, um, which um, already have come at a very high cost. Um, what, how do you envisage, um, I guess, um, what the future of Afghanistan's um, climate in terms of the, the political uh, aspect, but also society once they've come out of, of this uh, to the other side? And what impact will the virus have um, in the long term? So if we can start with Dr. Marvin, um, that will, yes, uh, if that's okay with you. Well, so much of it depends on what this side is like. Uh, never mind the other side. Uh, I think that, that that certainly is a concern here. But if the severity of the crisis is of such a dimension that it begins to tear at the fabric of the society, which is, which is very possible, which is very possible, uh, Afghanistan would not be unique that way. Uh, that would have enormous implications here for the kind of unifying uh, that the country, as I've been trying to emphasize here today, the kind of, of, of development that the country needs to have in order to be able to face this and other crises, uh, it's, it's that the problem, as much as there is a difficulty here uh, with the, the Taliban and, and, and finding uh, areas of common uh, purpose here and, and compromise, uh, so much of it depends on what the Afghans do, Afghan people do among themselves, particularly the political elites. Uh, unless this, unless they learn to be able to work together uh, and to be able to see beyond their own partisan uh, and personal uh, issues here, I, I, I'm not, you can't be too optimistic. But having said that, uh, I should also say that the history of Afghanistan has been one of enormous resilience at the same time. So I think that that's, that's also true. Uh, I think that in the long run, the Afghan people will be able to, to survive this as they've survived so much else. But the costs, that's, that's what we have to be concerned with right now. 
Um, yes, I'd like to now turn to um, Dr. Madrill for his remarks on the, on the subject. Thank you. I think that's the, the question you raise is the main part of the, the main scheme of the conversation we had today. We at the Ministry of Public Health, we have two responsibilities, major responsibility. First, uh, tackle the challenge of COVID-19 today, safety in our nation, and ensure that we, re we use the resources effectively to fill the gap of the system and come out of this uh, dilemma with a much more strengthened and resilient health system. And this is what, what we are, we're committed and we, what we are focused on. I should tell the audience that the picture is not that much hazy uh, um, as people may hear in the media. And uh, this battle proved us to, until now that our system was not that much weak, that we were thinking and others were thinking. Uh, the, sh the ship is not in the, now in the water and now we're sailing and we see that we have some strengths as well, besides all those failures that, are, that are, 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 have been highlighted during the last one or two decades. And the major one is our uh, human capital, our workforce, that even in the first one or two months, in, in, well, they were facing shortages of uh, PPEs, but uh, they kept the services up. Uh, and, and that's the um, major positive part. From resource perspective, uh, hopefully with the support of our international partners and with the uh, old government approach uh, led by the president, we're not facing any challenge today. It will take us another one or two weeks to get on track, uh, given the new, uh, the new uh, programs we have on board. Uh, the bigger, the other responsibility we have today as the health sector leaders is to make sure that the we do not allow the challenge of uh, COVID-19 become that much large that uh, just puts sh shadow on the peace talks and peace negotiations and just blocks it. We have to make sure that we pave the ground. We have to make sure that the, we, we help the politicians keep the momentum up. Uh, we will not uh, get these chances in, a lot in history, especially as, as I say, that our politicians has agreed ethically today then to focus on negotiation rather than, rather than ex exploitation of this opportunity. So uh, as, the, as a technical uh, person, as a technical ministry, we have two agendas today. Save our people from COVID-19, make sure that the health, and the health system is much more strengthened than before when we step into the relief and recovery phase. At the same time, in a bigger picture, we have the, our national responsibility to pave the ground for peace negotiations, let the politicians focus on peace talks and uh, do not deviate resources uh, or focus only on COVID-19 and lose those chances that will be much more tragic uh, uh, if not used effectively than COVID-19. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madrul, uh, for that um, hopeful um, uh, overview of where Afghanistan will be post-pandemic. Uh, post um, Dr. Kuberman, if you would like to give us your comments. So, you know, it sounds like uh, so frequently um, you hear that Afghanistan is facing a critical moment. It's become a cliche, um, you know, but I would argue that that really is the case now. And I would argue that Afghanistan has reached an inflection point uh, and that, um, you know, the war has intensified uh, talks or efforts to start to start talks have struggled, even though, as we discussed, there are some possible good signs. And amid all this, the pandemic is playing out in Afghanistan at the same time that the U.S. is on its way out. And make no mistake, you know, we could talk about how, what the frequency or how fast the pace of the withdrawal may be, but um, you're not, we're not far off from the day when most uh, U.S. troops will be out of the country, whether it's the end of this year or uh, into, into next spring. And I think that really presents a lot of multifaceted uh, challenges for, for Afghanistan, particularly given the fact that, at least in the near term, the, the U.S. and the international community will be so focused on other things, i.e. the pandemic, um, which will make it very difficult for a country, Afghanistan, which is so heavily dependent on so many different types of, um, of international support. So, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, I think that there's, there's good reason to be concerned. Um, 
but you know, Marvin made a very good point that uh, if we want to be optimistic, the, the word resilience is an important one to uh, to invoke here um, for uh, for sure. Just very quickly, a, a very quick point on the earlier question about refugees. I think that's a very important question to ask. I think that's something that we're going to be looking at a lot in Afghanistan in the coming uh, weeks and months. This idea of, of refugees returning to Afghanistan. Um, you know, there, most Afghan refugees outside of Afghanistan have been in Iran and in Pakistan. And yet in both of those countries in recent years, the uh, Afghan refugees have been facing increasing challenges. A number of them have been returning. This is not something that's just happened over the last few months. Of course, now with the coronavirus pandemic, it makes the, the, the challenges of the Afghan state all the more difficult in, in terms of how to, to receive and, and account for those uh, returning um, Afghan refugees. But um, you know, that's going to be a big issue uh, moving forward. So thank you. I guess you're recognizing me, even though you're muted. There we go. <laughs> um, thank okay. you. Um, yes, Dr. Well, well I, I just want to, I'm going to end on a positive note without negating any of the dangers of the, you know, there could be a, a terrible pandemic in uh, Afghanistan it could have uh, all of the uh, consequences we've been talking about, and, and I'm sure some that we uh, have not been smart enough to figure out. But I, I want to mention something that perhaps that Dr. Madru mentioned human capital. I want to focus on that a little bit. Um, when I went into Afghanistan as a consultant to the UN in 2002, there were no people like Wahid Madru because for 20 years, Young Afghans had not been able to get education professional except by leaving the country. There were people of Afghan background with professional education, but they were living in US, UK, India, Germany, and so on. But now uh, while we were, I were talking, I looked up his, uh, Dr. Mantra's background. He graduated from the Faculty of, of Medicine at the University of Herat in 2008, is that correct? Uh, and that means he was probably an, a young teenager in 2001, and he's been educated largely in Afghanistan since that time. And he is not the only person like that. There is now a cadre of educated young professionals uh, like uh, Dr. Madru, who are savvy. They're resilient like their elders, but they are educated and cosmopolitan like uh, their, co their international colleagues. And um, they are the people who may surprise us with, with how well they are able to confront uh, challenges like peace with the Taliban or the uh, pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Um, I'm, yes. Yes, Dr. Madro. Just two or three short sentences. During the last 20 years, all what, I, what we have heard, that we are in a critical situation. We have problems, we have failures, we have failed, and so on, at least for the last 20 years. Today, we can shape the situation in a way that uh, Afghanistan still has, well, is among one of the countries with lowest number of uh, infected people in death. If we do not compare it with the United States, if we compare it with Pakistan, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia, we will realize that the figures we provide is realistic. Uh, and it is not completely something vague. Secondly, it is the first time the Taliban in Afghans has have, have agreed to negotiate and talk. And the release of uh, prisoners every day is, is a good sign for that. And we still uh, have a commitment from the international community and the US government that they will not withdraw from, from Afghanistan unless the peace agreement is implemented to, as it is planned. So, and the Ministry of Public Health in the health system is not still uh, paralyzed. It still provides services. So in, in such a context, we, we can create much more hope and a ground for collaboration. And uh, especially when, when we come after 20 years when distrust is there, we have to make sure that we prove for our donors, for our partners, that there is a state system, there is an opportunity to further fill in, and uh, it will be used effectively and efficiently. Thank you very much. If I could just add one, one thought here, 
uh, and talking about human capital, and I agree with that entirely. That is the big change that we've seen. I can tell you, even going back in the 1970s, there wasn't anything which in any way came close to what now we have with young educated people. But above all, people who have an investment in this, in this system. They have an investment in this country that has emerged in the last nearly 20 years. And that investment uh, would be lost, most of them believe, were the Taliban to in any way come back in a commanding position. And I think because they all see themselves then as having no place in that system and ultimately as seeing themselves as refugees. So I think this is, a, is indeed a great hope here that we have such committed people here, people who are committed because really they have no alternative. I absolutely agree. And I think we all share the same sentiment that the next generation of Afghans are the future. And the, they're an asset uh, in terms of how Afghanistan uh, manages um, conflicts that it's been through for a very long time, uh, the unrest, the, and now we've got the pandemic uh, of the coronavirus. All of these uh, are not, uh, Afghanistan has not only recently faced uh, these challenges, it's, it's been going on for a very long time. And I would like to stress the importance of investing uh, in the, the, the youth of Afghanistan, both uh, in, 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 in the West, um, who are interested to go back to be able to use what they've learned um, to support the, the, the development process, but also um, supporting uh, the, the young people back in Afghanistan who, are, who want to, be, to have a stake uh, in, in the reconstruction and the, um, the future of the, the, the political um, process. Um, I, if no one else has any other comments to make. I think um, we will conclude it here today. Um, thank you to all of our wonderful audience who have contributed a wealth of questions and comments, which um, I'm sure we will look at um, following uh, this discussion as well and see how we can address those in future. Um, events. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Madro for taking time out uh, of his schedule. I'm sure it's, um, uh, it was uh, fasting had uh, just occurred when he had joined us online. So we do appreciate it. Um, and thank God that the, that the internet was working throughout the discussion. At least that's one thing that we can uh, celebrate in, in the achievement that Afghanistan has made over the last 20 years, that we've got amazing connection uh, and technology. Um, and I will also now like to thank all of our wonderful panelists who, um, for their rich con discussion and contribution, um, and one that was um, definitely characterized by um, a great deal of passion and commitment um, and con contribute contribution to Afghanistan. So thank you for that. Uh, and um, yeah, we hope to be able to uh, speak to you again uh, sometime in the future. Thank you.